My name is Maureen Abihanam, and I'm a PhD student here at um, Columbia's Urban Planning Program, and I'll be moderating the session. I will start with a few brief logistical announcements and then introduce our speaker. During the talk, I'd like to remind audience, audience members um, to please uh, mute your microphones. Um, anyone in the audience who wishes not to be recorded today should turn off their video input. The chat box should only be used for discussion regarding the session. If you have technical questions that apply only to you, please message me uh, privately or my co-host, Joe Hennekins. We encourage all of you to type questions into the chat box during the presentation. After the presentation, we will have time for Q&A. We'll start Q&A around 2 or 2.15 so that we have time uh, to you know, go over everyone's questions. I'll be coordinating the Q&A with attention to diversity and inclusion. So if you have already had the chance to ask questions, please allow others to do so before uh, asking another one. And finally, to ask questions, participants can either use the raise the hand feature in Zoom, and we will call on you to unmute, or you may also type your question in the box and I can read them out. Chao Wei is a designer, writer, and coder. The creative director at Logic Magazine, their work encompasses community-based and public art projects, data visualization, technology, ecology, and education. Their projects have been finalists for the Index Design Awards and featured by the New York Times, the BBC, CNN, Vice, and elsewhere. Their most recent project, The Future of Memory, was a recipient of the Mozilla Creative Media Award. They are the author of the book, Blockchain Chicken Farm and Other Stories of Tech in China's Countryside. Today, Chao Wei's talk entitled Blockchain Chicken Farms and Tabao Villages asks, what happens when tech goes down to the countryside? Smart cities, digital urbanism, and the urban space of tech-enabled surveillance have been well-documented. However, what awaits in the periphery in those places that manufacture the hardware we use. In their talk, Chao Wei looks at the flows between rural America and rural China through online consumption culture and platform enabled e-commerce. From the religious performance of American multi-level marketing to the self-improvement tones of Taobao villages in China, our speaker argues that tech is carving out new spaces and behaviors in countrysides struck by neoliberal precarity. Chao Wei discusses China's rural revitalization project, challenging our metronormativity and the ways the periphery influences our social and political lives as urbanites. Chao Wei, if you're ready, I'll pass things over to you now. Great. Um, yeah, thank you again for inviting me. Um, so lovely to give this talk, um, especially in the planning department. Um, I thought that I would start out first by um, acknowledging that I'm calling in from the Bay Area, which is on unceded Ohlone territory. Um, I also um, would actually like to start off by reading just a very short intro from the book, um, which might be weird for an academic setting, but uh, I guess because, uh, you know, we do book readings at bookstores, but it's fine. Um, so yeah, so this is... Um, very short uh, section from the introduction of the book. Um, there it is. The dynamics of rural China are not isolated to China itself. Yet because of its geographic distance from the United States, it remains a kind of periphery. These rural peripheries, the edges of the world hidden from view enable our existence in cities. These areas produce everything from the cotton and the clothes we wear to the minerals that create the computers and data centers. They also produce the food we eat. As humans, we eat to survive and our appetite for food has carved new geographies and technologies into the world. Urbanite appetites have shifted rural economies, ecologies and societies over the past three decades. Looking at technology in rural China in places that show how globally entangled we are with one another allows me to confront the scarier question that technology poses. What does it mean to live to be human right now? 
Looking at tech in rural China forced me to examine the ideologies that drive engineers and companies to build everything from AI farming systems and blockchain food projects to shopping sites and payment platforms. These assumptions about humans and the way the world should work are more powerful than just sheer technical curiosity. Embedded in these tools are the, the makers and builders assumptions about what humans need and how they think humans should interact. It is not enough to critique these assumptions because in simply critiquing, we remain caught in the long list of binaries. Tech is dehumanizing, tech brings liberation, tech dragged us into the mess that we're in and tech frees us from this mess. Tech creates isolation and tech connects. The difficult work that we face is to live and thrive beyond binaries and assumptions and to aid and enable others to do so. So how do we begin this work? At the age of 95, five years before her death, the activist Grace Lee Boggs wrote The Next American Revolution. Published in 2010, the book sounded an alarm bell for our present condition, a time when politics was no longer politics as usual and when ecological disaster wrought by unfettered material and technological growth was looming. Despite all this, she pointed to a source of hope, which is the great turning. The great turning refers to a growing tidal wave of people now taking the first step toward change, addressing spiritual impoverishment. These are the times to grow our souls, she writes. The way to respond to crisis is to practice compassion and change the cycle of suffering. We can all actively practice compassion in our own way, whether we are doctors, teachers, or business people. Engineers and makers and builders of the technology have this opportunity. I hope this book sparks something for you. After all, code is words made executable and we must take care in what we say. And for those of us who see a code as apocryphal texts, who see technology as indeed accelerating us towards a despondent, tightly controlled world. I hope this book reaffirms the power that you hold in being human and demonstrates ways certain technologies might actually serve open systems. To spark the great turning, we need to transform our compassion, our imagination, and our society. We cannot focus on simply reforming our technologies alone. And most of all, I hope that this book brings you to parts of China that you might never visit beyond a map of abs abstractions, a flat map made by metronormativity. Great, so now um, I'll start the talk in a more traditional format and I'll show some slides. Let me uh, juggle this. You are now made a co-host, shall we? So please let me know if you're having any trouble sharing. Okay. Sorry, I have multiple desktops and this always happens, okay. All right, can everyone see this title slide? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, uh, I didn't actually mean to <laughs> end up in rural China. Um, I get this question a lot from people who come to talks and they're like, how did you get caught up in such a niche topic? And after studying rural China for so long, I started the research process maybe like four, three and a half years ago um, to me, I'm like, this is not a niche topic. Like, this is something that we have to be thinking about. Um, and I'll get to why in a second. But I think that really thinking about the rural as constitutive of the urban is key, um, you know, especially in the times that we live in. So my research really challenged me to, you know, own up and think about uh, these ideas of metronormativity. So it's this word that is coined by queer theorist Jack Halberstam, which refers to, um, which uh, is referred to as like the dominant story of migration from the countryside to the city, right? Um, and 
would probably think of examples uh, just even anecdotally, like the story of like, oh, we'll just go to the city and we'll experience this new like place of liberation and economic opportunity. But it's really this kind of supremacy of the city as co cosmopolitan and the rural as really backwards in time, right? Um, and so I think challenging this metronormativity also makes us think about modernity and what we think of as development, right? And sustainability. So there's a long tradition of looking at rural areas as backwards and stuck in this quaint time. Um, there's this book, The Charisma Machine, which I highly recommend. Um, but all of this, this concept of development is under uh, what folks call ICT4D, um, the you know, Internet Communications Technology for Development. And there's been a number of schemes throughout the years. Uh, so Facebook with its free basics program, um, you see the weather balloon, that's Project Loon, which is Google's project to like give internet to the poor rural areas of the world. Um, there's also the Microsoft uh, hole in the wall project. Um, which like just literally takes a wall and <laughs> makes a hole and puts a computer in there, right? Um, and so I think one of the things the Charisma Machine really highlights is, you know, this idea of just giving folks in these backward, quote unquote, backward regions of the world technology, that's applying a technical fix to a social problem, right? And that's never really going to work the way that you imagine it to work. Um, I also think it's important to highlight that, that, you know, we all live in 2021. So the fact that some places of the world don't look like San Francisco or Shanghai says more about the way that we think about these spaces rather than the need to like bring these spaces to our modern day and time, right? And of course, um, many architects, uh, you know, still like this notion of the rural being backwards. So it becomes almost like a zoo, right? Of like, look at these farmers, they have computers, it's so exotic. And uh, it's a deeply problematic way. And I think it's also very dehumanizing um, to people who live in rural areas, right? So my uh, journey into researching the countryside actually began in Shenzhen. Um, so, you know, the statistics of Shenzhen as a city manufactures 90% of the world's electronics, um, mega city of 13 million people. And this is actually um, this old uh, 1984 map um, back when Shenzhen was still developing of uh, the town and village enterprises. So it was like this very cluster village driven uh, mode of economic development that was really from the grassroots up, right? Um, and so the urban villages of Shenzhen today uh, kind of tap into that history um, as a reminder of that history. Um, but I began in Shenzhen, which is now this huge city. It's home to Huaxiang Bay, which is shown here. And um, it's this sprawling electronics market that's like a couple city blocks wide. It's also home to Shanjai, which is translated loosely as mountain stronghold. Um, this practice of making knockoff uh, DVDs and electronics for people who couldn't afford name brand electronics. So people from mountain strongholds. And I look at this in my book specifically, arguing that instead of simply knockoffs, um, which has all these connotations of racialized labor, right? Because it's seen as knockoffs because these mindless Chinese factory drones must not be able to be creative. Um, so it must be a knockoff. Um, I actually think that Shanjai is this really interesting phenomenon to challenge how we think about both ownership, intellectual property and invention and creativity. So I highly recommend actually Sylvia Lintner's Prototype Nation for those who are interested in a deep dive on this phenomenon. Um, but it, you know, Shanjai, because it does challenge IP, um, it is this kind of fast, open, moving, open source where, you know, anyone can, you know, tweak, modify and change this hardware that's being made. Um, it really starts to call into question like, well, you know, you have an Apple iPhone right now, right? And if you break it, you need to take it to the Apple store. Even the machinery to open up the iPhone is proprietary and specialized. And Shenzhen is very counter to that. 
It's about modularity. It's about open source. It's about the right to repair and being able to intervene on these systems. So during this time, uh, I uh, met David Lee from the Shenzhen Open Innovation Lab. And he was like, just go to the countryside, like Shenzhen, New York, Shanghai, all these cities have very similar patterns of technology use. Um, what you're going to find is something really much more fascinating and actually challenging uh, in the countryside. So I started to dig in and encountered, you know, uh, this economist who was talking constantly about the rural origins of Chinese capitalism. And so for those who haven't been to China, the countryside and the city are pretty different. Um, and in the book, I talk, touch upon agrarian transition, which is a process that allows places like Shenzhen to exist. Um, it's a process that has already happened in the US. So it's basically what agrarian transition is, is you know, a declining number of farmers due to the entry of industrial agriculture and industrial agriculture requiring large consolidation of land. And the idea behind that is that it enables urban growth, right? So you have less farmers, more people in cities, more efficient industrialized agriculture, the rise of a white collar working class like software engineers. Um, and it's really you know, what we see in the rural American landscape now, right? We, have like these huge industrialized factory farms with corporate lobbyists. Um, one thing I always like to mention is that, you know, there's actually only 2 million farmers left in the US. Um, but at the same time, the American uh, Farm Bureau Federation, which is like uh, this uh, federation of basically big agribusiness, they have 6 million members. So it just says a lot about the landscape of American farming is that it's basically corporate lobbyists from like Monsanto. Um, and so China right now is kind of facing this, right? There's still a lot of the bulk of farmers are smallholder farmers. And this really becomes, you know, the question of like, how do you balance all this? Um, you know, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the stories of like migrants from the countryside in the cities, um, not having equal access to uh, social services. Um, then the question of like, well, we can't have everyone going into the city. How do we keep people in the countryside, basically? Um, and, you know, around this, of course, the central issue of, I mean, global agricultural trade, right? That food is a commodity um, and not really fully the thing that we eat, right? So in the US, we actually produce far more food um, than we can eat so that we can trade it. And this goes into this uh, crazy financial realm of commodities and futures trading. So I think through all of this, what I really um, have come across that I think speaks to a really clear framework for thinking about this is Ananya Roy's idea of the rural and the urban as forms of governance rather than these issues of like density or you know there must be something cultural or time-based about uh, rural versus urban. And I think so this image in the back really points to it where if we think of it as a form of governance right this kind of urban sense of like total surveillance control, like making sure that everyone's this like accounted for citizen. Um, this form of governance is now pretty prevalent in the countryside. So you have um, these cameras monitoring everything on this industrial hog farm. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the rise of tech companies implementing things like pig face recognition to scale up um, hog farming. And uh, the reason why they use all these cameras and sensors is to, you know, make sure that uh, pigs are biosecure, right? That they maintain biosecurity so that one sick pig doesn't just like uh, tear through the entire um, farm. So the blockchain chickens, um, speaking of food as uh, more of a commodity now, this is the blockchain chicken farmer, Farmer Jiang. Um, and, you know, beautiful, uh, lovely farm in 
this pretty remote area of Guizhou. And he was encountering all sorts of issues with getting his, um, his chickens, not only to market because of lack of infrastructure, but then also this basic issue of food security, uh, food safety and trust. Um, because all these big agribusinesses, so the US also went through this as well. So you can think of like Uptown Sinclair's, um, what is it, the jungle with like meat slaughtering, um, like these food safety laws in the 1920s in the US, right? So China, because there's all these big agribusinesses coming in and these smaller farmers who are really pressured um, to uh, produce and, you know, it's just harder and harder to uh, gain profit when you're being pressured by a large agribusiness. Um, so, you know, farmers start to cheat, but they cheat badly, right? Um, so you can think of the uh, melamine milk scandal where dairy farmers added melamine into milk powder um, to try and basically like increase the amount of powder for how much dairy that they're putting in. Um, and so farmer Jiang, when he was trying to sell his chickens at first, um, they're these beautiful free range chickens. Uh, no one really believed him that they were free range. So this tech company came in and <laughs> implemented blockchain chicken farm and it's on a proprietary blockchain. So, which means that no one, but the company actually is able to see the records. And uh, this is sold on JD.com for around like 35 to $40. Uh, the chicken has this, you can see that little bracelet on its uh, wrist um, and you can scan the QR code you can learn a lot about the chicken, like how many steps it's taken, how much it weighed. Um, but, you know, when I was talking to Farmer Jiang, he was like, yeah, I sold all of these chickens. Like they were very popular. And it's mainly upper middle class urbanites in China who are willing to pay for this, right? It's quite expensive. This is a image of the village. So this contrast between um, you know, this like high tech seeming product, but ultimately it's like, I see it as a form of like marketing, right? Um, making its entryway into this beautiful area. Um, one of the things that they mentioned, which was really interesting was like, you know, they're trying to economically develop and they have a lot of young um, folks who used to live in the village who went to the cities for um, college, they're like moving back and trying to find ways to economically develop the village. And, you know, there is that pressure, right, of like, Farmer Jiang couldn't really sell his chickens um, because there was such lack of um, trust around food safety issues um, and just like not, not great prices um, being paid for agricultural commodities in the first place. So I also visited a Taobao village. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Taobao. I feel like Taobao villages have been talked uh, a lot about in uh, urban planning literature. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, this is uh, China's number one Taobao village. And it's it located in Shandong province, which is more towards the north. Um, and it's, not mountainous. So, you know, this area is easy to put roads in, like very easy to like get infrastructure in. So in this Taobao village, um, they produce dance and stage uniforms. Um, they produce like 70% of uh, dance and stage uniforms for China. So, you know, stuff that like you would see people wearing for a film, like a period documentary or, uh, sorry, like a, you know, like 1949 war um, uh, drama or something like that. And so just to give you a little bit of background, Taobao is, um, you know, uh, owned by Alibaba, um, which recently has made headlines. Um, but it's really this, I mean, it's kind of like eBay slash Amazon but it only sells new products. So you can buy anything on Taobao. You can get uh, sheep sprains, food, 
these really cool uh, troll lighters. You can also get banned uh, video games and sellers have gotten really uh, smart about bypassing the kind of automated image recognition. So Resident Evil 2 is banned and so sellers would hand draw the covers for the videos to like bypass uh, getting it taken down. And these Taobao villages, I'm sorry that this map slash figure is a little bit outdated, but it's been experiencing a lot of exponential growth. So in 2014, there was only around 200 of them, 2016, um, 1,300 or so. And then at this point, I think there's like uh, several thousand of these. Um, it, at first, they're mainly located along the coast, but um, Alibaba actually has a rural development institute which they like to think of themselves as like somewhere between an NGO or like related to the World Bank. Um, and they study this and they try to like, you know, document and track these Taobao villages uh, uh, in a fair detail. So this rural Taobao strategy has two prongs to it, which is rural citizens as consumers. And so they have these uh, Taobao stations in these uh, rural villages where you can go and you're a villager and you're like, oh, it would be great to like buy some fancy shampoo, right? Like I deserve this. And so you go onto Taobao.com and you have people who are like assisting you in buying things uh, from Taobao. So shampoo, train tickets, everything. Um, uh, for the Rural Development Institute, they say that this is a form of digital literacy. Um, how you can spin it, <laughs> um, that's, yeah. But of course, in order to buy things, you need money, right? Um, and certainly with the tangled web of global agricultural trade, like you selling wheat is not going to be enough to buy your fancy shampoo. So they're like, okay, well, we'll also have rural citizens as sellers. So that's these Taba villages where they're starting to, you know, sell things from like, uh, so it's instead of like, you know, if you're a potato farmer, instead of just selling potatoes, you're like adding some process to them. They put chili flakes on this in the village that I visited and they make them into like spicy potato chips that you can buy on Taobao. Um, of course, the one where I visited and spent the most time in with the dance uniforms, like that's an extreme, right? It's totally unrelated to uh, anything that they used to grow. Um, and this is a policy that, you know, is really embraced um, by on the national level. Um, it's this idea of revitalization, right? Like we're reinvigorating the countryside. It used to just be old people and small children who are left behind by their parents who gone off to the city to work in factories. But now we're creating this new kind of economic opportunity. So this is a rural internet center in the uh, village, this particular village that was making the stage uniforms. Um, you can see that it really still is like a farming town, right? So it's this one building, it's a rural internet center and across the street it's fields. But inside, so once you get to the town, it's this wild, like, uh, you know, really kind of family, extended family, like business where people are working out of their garages. So this was one of the workshops. Um, everyone likes to employ members of their family, which is why you see a lot of uh, middle aged or elderly women. Um, and you know, the first entrepreneur, I'll get to, I'll get to him in a second, actually. Um, so, you know, uh, this is another scene from one of the, um, from one of the workshops. So it's really this whole ecosystem. Um, you have like one family who's making these giraffe headpiece things. Um, you have another family who's doing more screen printing, another family who's like, you know, doing embroidery. Um, and so this entire village has really been subsumed by this costume industry. Um, sorry, I just really <laughs> like these crazy costumes. They also had this knockoff Snow White costume that I uh, became obsessed with. 
So yeah, so this is a picture of the outside of what those workshops look like. Um, you know, they, you would never guess that's what they look like on the inside. Um, but behind the workshops, you still have like the family agricultural fields. And they're telling me that it's almost like gig farming. Um, so in the agricultural high season, they'll do farming and then they'll, you know, supplement their income with producing uh, these costumes. Uh, so this was the first entrepreneur uh, in the village. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about him. Uh, so he is actually now the uh, village party secretary now. He was voted in. He actually didn't want the job at all because he was He's pretty, he says he's pretty busy with all, you know, raising kids, running a business, farming. Um, and he had heard about Taobao uh, from, you know, just like some, he used to work in the city. He had heard about Taobao there and he kind of brought this back to the village. Um, his wife wasn't able to work. Uh, he had started to, uh, for like, um, she had injured her back because she was working at a sand quarry. And so he started the first Tabo village, uh, Tabo business in the village. Um, he actually was telling me he didn't know how to type Chinese onto a computer because he didn't finish grade school. So he had to use his daughter's uh, pinyin textbook to figure out how to like put the listings onto the computer. Um, and so now he's like making, I think, he told me it was around like 1 million US dollars a year. And he's like shipping internationally as well um, because Amazon has made it uh, pretty easy for foreign sellers to sell on Amazon. Um, these are just scenes, um, more scenes from the village. It's this, you know, you have the contrast of like the wet market that still happens um, alongside uh, I feel like the cake with the uh, 100 RMB uh, bills just kind of summarizes how flush the village has become with cash. Um, and so you can see this was another workshop that I visited. This husband and wife, um, they uh, were specialized in army uniforms uh, or like not real army uniforms, but obviously for like dramas. And it's very much a, uh, you know, startup affair, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and here's also the grandmother um, helping out. Uh, they were telling me that for the grandmother, uh, she derived, I think, a sense of like purpose and not just being old and sitting around. Um, so, of course, you know, this was like the kind of, uh, you know, optimistic side that I think a lot of people like to think about and represent. Um, of course, everyone in the village uh, uses Ant Financial, um, which is the sister company of Alibaba. So they use this mobile app um, for uh, fiscal transactions. Um, they can also take money out uh, through the Taobao uh, village like um, service stations, um, but mobile banking is kind of the default in these villages. Um, and somehow the weird mix of market and state is both dystopic, but also not, I don't know, that foreign from what we see in the US. So all of these things um, actually plug into this larger system of uh, American entrepreneurship. So drop shipping has gotten really big. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you are on Facebook Live in the weird crevices of the internet, um, but essential oils, uh, suburban housewives in red voting states selling essential oils and all like, you know, leggings, all these things, all of it is really fueled by the explosion of these smaller uh, e commerce manufacturers. Um, because it's so much cheaper. It's what uh, David Harvey calls like the spatial fix, right? Like it gets really expensive to manufacture in big cities. Like Walmart can have its own factory, but now there's this other ecosystem where, you know, you as a 
mid-sized entrepreneur in the U.S. can buy things off of AliExpress or Alibaba.com from these smaller manufacturers. You can try doing drop shipping, place some Instagram ads, um, you know, sell on Amazon. So this this uh, coat um, is very popular on Amazon and TikTok right now. Um, but that's actually uh, you know, a factory, home factory in rural China, right? It's this kind of weird in-between of you going to like a big clothing manufacturer or like a boutique Etsy handmade. It's this like mid middle space. Um, one brand strategist I talked to, she was like, it's the future. It's like new retail. Like everyone can be an entrepreneur on Instagram. Um, and of course, you know, this has been like a, its own ecosystem of drop shipping um, tools, uh, Instagram fakes. Um, so yeah, so I will just end there and open it up for questions. One thing that I will say is that I did manage to talk to one person who was really cynical and he was talking about the Taba village and he said, um, you know, it's really like Alibaba is a vampire that sucks the blood out of everything. Um, you know, they're using government built infrastructure because the government puts in the fiber optic cable, the roads, everything, right? Um, and the one thing that they don't tell you when you start becoming an entrepreneur is that you have to buy ads. And it's this incredible race to the bottom where you're buying ads, you know, there's multiple people who are starting their own, like, so he made uh, shoes, dance shoes, like multiple dance shoe sellers. And he's just, you have to cost cut in ways that you can't even imagine. Um, and he was just like, it's all a scam, but everyone knows that. And we're just trying to get rich while we can before this fades away. Um, and this actually, speaking of the Rural Development Institute and trying to think of themselves as like a NGO or a development agency, Alibaba is actually trying to export this model to other areas along the One Belt, One Road initiative. So to places in Southeast Asia, they're trying to partner with places in like Rwanda as well as South Africa to think of like, oh, well, we can help you revitalize the countryside through this e-commerce um, model and supply chain. So yeah, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Xiaowei, for this fascinating presentation. Um, we would like to open it up to questions, as you said. So as a reminder to ask questions, participants are encouraged to either use the raise your hand feature in Zoom, and I will call on you to unmute, or you can also type your questions in the chat box and we can read them out. Wenfei. Hi, Xiaowei. That was that was so cool. Um, <laughs> I feel like um, you kind of uh, have brought to the surface like the kind of the the the, the commerce um, that underlies like you know the growth of Amazon, right? Which we hear about like all the time, but we never really consider, and we kind of factually know that you know there's this entire like industry in rural China that in kind of other uh, parts of, you know, these kind of uh, global South countries as well that are um, kind of fueling this uh, growth, but you never really kind of see or kind of think about these spaces in more detail. But what I thought was really interesting, um, uh, what I guess like one question that I had about your talk um, kind of mentioned that there's this kind of rural urban like governance tension. But what struck me, especially in the kind of the latter half of your presentation about the Taobao villages, is that all, kind of all these villages seem to be governed by like Alibaba. So there's really this kind of like e-commerce governance um, that seems like really, uh, you know, present in China. So could you talk about that a little bit and also kind of in relation to how um, these like large e-governance uh, corporations interact with the with the government, like the Chinese government, like that kind of image that you had of, um, you know, 
like did you tell about today kind of the connection between like like you know china like you know chinese government and like this kind of e-commerce governance um yeah so i i don't know if that was a succinct enough question but i think you get the idea yeah no that's a great question i was just um I have a friend who studies the social credit system in um, in depth, uh, so beyond the hype, um, in uh, major cities in China. And we always talk about this, where in some like really scary ways, like you know, these corporations are governing all these facets um, across the urban and the rural. It's like this weird new form of nation statehood that, you know, so Alibaba through um, it, the Alipay app, that's where the credit score is implemented, right? And so it's like, you know, it has these tentacles into the countryside. It also has these tentacles in the city um, where you're using credit for a different purpose, right? Um, and as we're seeing too, like governments, uh, specifically China's government is not psyched on this um, in recent news, you know, they're having Jack Ma under supervision, all these regulatory questions because it is a challenge to state power. Um, I think in the US actually, you know, I guess it's up for debate some, but I think in the US there's actually like very little um, regulatory action taken towards these large corporations, uh, tech companies in terms of like how much power they're gaining over logistics, over banking, over all these things. Um, in terms of uh, just like this, um, weird like e-governance that's emerging um i don't yeah i don't know what will become of it um but i think it's interesting to always like like see the similarities that are happening across these different borders um and also how connected everything is by by capital Did that answer your question? I might have missed a part. Lanier? Yeah, thank you. Um, Xiaowei, this was absolutely riveting. Thank you so much. Um, in your conversations in some of these Taobao villages, what is the perception? It seems like there's a real sense of urgency to kind of jump in and get in while the getting's good. Is there, what are the conversations around the longevity of this, the sustainability of this? Like what? What is this economy looking like on the ground for, for people who are engaged in it? And what do they think the future holds? Yeah, I think ultimately it comes down to the fact that they don't really have a choice, right? Um, for a number of ecological and environmental reasons, um, you know, farming's just not as profitable as it used to be. Um, and so as they're getting squeezed, like this is really kind of the only um, alternative to that, right? There are some models of, uh, so in the book, I talk about this one like organic rice farming co-op, this village that has really gone against what the local government's uh, agricultural bureau is telling them. And they're trying to revitalize farming and um, in this more sustainable way, but they're encountering a lot of tension, right? Um, because it just goes against the paradigm in so many ways. So the Taobao village one, it's more just like, well, we kind of have no choice. And like, while we can still do it, we might as well be the first to get all this infrastructure in, make some money, and then maybe in the future, you know, and I think that part of the government hopes that this happens too, is that the village really becomes more of a town, becomes more of like maybe a smaller city. Um, and then you just have like one, one or two like large companies that are just farming the land and it's really consolidating, consolidating the land and making it more efficient. I think Juan has a question. Um, yeah, building off of Lanier's question and what you just told us, how has this influ like massive influx influx of cash has have uh, 
reshaped the, the the urban landscape of these villages because I imagine there's you know like logistic centers or shipping centers or other type of infrastructure but what else has been going on in the built environment of these villages yeah um it's uh someone termed it uh haphazard lack of planning so a lot of the villages that i visited um you know just to give you a sense before like these villages didn't have like wastewater treatment didn't have you know um plumbing systems things like that right and so you go to these villages now and it's like there's so much development happening in such a short time that a lot of the infrastructure is actually quite shoddy um and you know so they brag about having like oh we have the internet that is faster than shanghai's that's like fiber optic cables being built in um and then at the same time like you you go to like some of the places and they're just like well we don't have water for like hot water for today like sorry about that and so it's this this contrast um and the, to your point about the logistics um centers that is definitely happening across the countryside i mean it's I, I live in California and it's weird to see like the different um, kind of mirroring effects because we have a lot of Amazon warehouses here. Like I think in rural America, like uh, logistics and rural prisons are like the biggest um, economic development uh, sectors. And so in rural China, it's, I mean, it's very similar, lots of logistics centers going in. We have a question in the chat box. I'm going to read it out for you. So hi, Chawe. I'm really intrigued by the contrast between your depiction of China's rural area, both farming and Taobao villages, with the rise of influencers like Li Siqi, whose reach ultimately depends on an idyllic mirage of rural Chinese villages. Um, so I guess it was more of a comment from Coral Seng. Yeah. Um... I, I think uh, there's some people who term that like rural gentrification, which is, I think, a really interesting term to think about, but happening also globally, right? Like young folks who are like, I'm going to go back into the countryside and like live my digital nomad life and as an influencer. And it's, it's interesting that like globally there is this rise as well. We have another question from Chaifan Wang. Thanks for the great presentation. I'm wondering, in your opinion, does Taobao village phenomenon really revitalize the rural area or is it more an intrusion to the local community? It's definitely an intrusion. Um, <laughs> it's more of a, uh, was that the creative destruction of capitalism? It's like good for a little while, but none of these like infrastructures, the buildings, it all has this like very temporary feeling. Like from the photos, you probably got the sense that like all the buildings are just like, we'll put them there and so probably we'll not use them in a few years, right? Thank you. There's another another question from um, Iris. So thanks, Chawe. Do you or the villagers you spoke to see this as a kind of alternative model uh, going to work in a bigger industry in bigger industrial factories and the typical stereotype of large scale rural factories we're familiar with. For instance, it seems that villagers see in this model the ability to maintain family ties as a plus versus moving away and living in dormitories. Yeah, I mean that's definitely, you know what there is all these signs like nothing beats coming home and running your own tab out business and so many of the um kind of literature that you can get at the like town halls is all about like college grads moving home to take care of their grandparents and you know this software engineer coming back home and helping their dad with their tab out business um and i think it is a plus but at the same time, like, because it's so precarious, um, it's not like, you know, you're coming home to help your parents with this like new 
this like form of farming that could be sustainable or this other thing that could be sustainable. So yeah, it's, it's a weird precarious balance. So I, I had a question for you. Um, building off of this uh, precariousness of such, um, you know, such e-commerce business. Uh, so what, you know, in general, like what are the challenges that these Taobao villages have faced um, after uh, adopting, you know, the Taobao model? And um, could you talk more about this like precarity? Like wh why is it not sustainable? What is standing in the way of this being a more long-term um, solution to some of these villages that are not able to farm or access uh, urban areas for other services? Yeah, I think a lot of this is like, it's, you know, there's something really concrete and fascinating about the built environment of the Taba village, right, and these different contrasts. And yet at the same time, it's always within this larger context of um, markets, pricing, things like that. And so um, as an example, like there were some failed Tabao villages. There were also some other Tabao villages that were like maybe a little bit more streamlined, um, but there are some failed Tabao villages that I visited. And ultimately it came down to the same thing, which is like, you know, they were selling kiwis and then it turns out that this other village is like, actually, we're going to sell kiwis too. And it's just like, at a certain point, like, like you just have the farmers taking all the risk on this platform, right? Um, whereas national uh, agricultural policy, there is like forms of subsidies, like grants, things like that, that are designed to like um, offset risk a little bit. I mean, that's slowly disappearing, but um, it's really just this like competition, um, you know, things get more expensive as you go inland, which is why the Rural Development Institute folks, they were like, yeah, we prefer it when places along the coast um, do Taba villages because it makes us look more successful. It actually like skews the numbers when places inland do it because they're just not competitive as uh, production sites. So interesting. I have so many questions, but I'll leave others to it. Um, we have one more question in the chat box from Nicholas Rapp. Hi, Chawe, thank you for your great talk. Would you possibly speak about the Taobao villages as a type of spatial product, like the special economic zone? Could you talk a bit more about how this is expanding into other countries, like you mentioned at the end? Yeah, so that's actually an area of research that um, I'm just starting to look into more. Um, I think that it is like a strange and weird, fascinating ecosystem, right? Where it's, I think before, like you have like Keller Easterlings like zone, right? Where we think about um, these free trade zones and they're like very much like government driven and, you know, these big corporations. But there is something that um, I would love to continue looking into this which is this like middle sized strange zone, right? <laughs> this like spatial model of the village where it's not like clearly, you know, Alibaba. It's, um, it's not like Alibaba is like, okay, we like built this gigantic area and it's very industrialized. There's still something very like informal um, about it. Um, and it's also plugging into like an end consumer that's like, not shopping at like Nordstrom, right? It's like the person who's like, I want a knockoff version of, or like kind of looks similar, but like not name brand version of this winter coat, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to look into for the future. Uh, Joe has a question. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could just talk a little more about um, the the concept of metro normativity that you opened the talk with I was uh, I had never heard that term before but then during the talk I was struck that that both the blockchain and the the Taobao guy that you profiled both of those it seemed to be where the idea had sort of been generated in the city and then come to the to the periphery so with metro normativity are, do you see these Taobao villages and other things as sort of a challenge to metro normativity 
itself or is that more just sort of your your frame of your sort of of your sort of research program of, of going to the countryside yeah i think it was a really it was a helpful framing for me i think too so um you know the metro normativity part i became interested in um especially there's uh, this organization called uh, Queer Appalachia. And, you know, I started getting really interested in it because especially during like the 2016 election, right? It was this narrative of like, oh, rural people, like everyone is in rural areas is, you know, white and, you know, poor and X, Y, Z, right? Um, and so I really became interested in like, challenges to this through representation. Um, so queer Appalachia, they're like, actually, no, like queer folks live in the countryside and like, just there's not an, like people don't write about them, right? And actually that representation is important for like survival and for community, right? Um, to like normalize that, you know, it isn't just like ex coal miners. Um, and I think too, for me, the spirit really carried through the research because knowing this kind of like weird OMA fascination with the countryside, like, gee, golly, farmers know how to press buttons. Like that's super problematic. Um, and wanting to keep that spirit um, through the research, through also the way that I was talking to people, uh, you know, making it like much more an ethnographic account than like, you know, there's another part of my brain when I started off writing the book where I was like, it would be cool to have like all these maps and like exploded diagrams and all these things. Um, but actually then just veering away from that way of looking in general. Thank you. We have one more question in the chat box from Sarah Maudusley. Thank you, Chawe, for a wonderful talk. I was wondering, do any of these Taobao villages see normal retail? or is it limited to e-commerce? Um, so it's entirely e-commerce. And um, through the, um, when I was talking about the rural villagers as consumers, like when you go into these villages, everything is like a courier, like brought these things to you. Um, and you go to the grocery store and they'll have like different stuff depending on the day that you're there. Like it's, clearly not the like Cisco food systems. We come like very regularly. We always had the same things. It's just like whatever they decided to buy from the internet that week. Um, and you can like request things. Uh, it's very, it's this like thing where you're just like, we're all just like material beings that are like flows for e-commerce and like mobile payment like none of this feels real in a sense but is also real Winfrey, do you have something else i guess i just have like one last really short question which is that you know kind of we have this and maybe you even mentioned it, this kind of, um, this understanding that like, yeah, like rural China is kind of significantly poorer than kind of our residents in urban areas. Do you think that kind of despite the precarity of these Taobao villages that they are in fact kind of overall um, kind of improving the quality of life in some, you know, material senses uh, uh, from, you know, than before? I mean, definitely. I think the successful ones have really, really changed. I mean, the village has become like a town, basically. Um, and they're able to rent. So a huge thing um, similar here is like they've had a hard time keeping teachers previously because teachers are like, I don't want to live in middle of nowhere where I like don't have access to anything cool. Um, and now a lot of these places, uh, they're able to have like a more robust education system. And so it is changing that dynamic a lot, a lot more um, that next generation can like, uh, you know, have a different life. Okay, so I, we have a question from Savannah. Uh, thank you for your talk. 
what are you working on next and what are some resources to understand this changing landscape? Yeah, so I have to admit that in some bizarre way, and I'd be curious for others who like do uh, research in China, um, I, my resources are mainly like reading articles on WeChat, but also specifically like these large, like, like 200 person WeChat groups, like I got roped into one with like some people from the Alibaba Rural Development Institute. And it's just like, please let me out of here. Cause there's like some really weird, you know, like they're like hawkish about rural development across the world. Um, and sometimes it takes on like a really nationalistic tone that is very uncomfortable, but those are generally my resources. Cause I find a lot of the official more like you know, I, I think Sixth Tone has a good amount of like rural China coverage, um, but they are like a state sponsored newspaper. So oftentimes it's like very like, yay, everything's great. Um, in terms of what I'm working on next, I'm working on passing my qualifying exams. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Xiaowei, for your talk. I think, you know, I speak for many of us who found this like quite fascinating. You took us on a on a trip to the other side of the world into a place that is just not, you know, I, I don't think I've, I knew all of this was happening. And um, I personally look forward to reading your book. Um, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come here and speak to us today. Um, uh, as for everyone else, on behalf of uh, GSAP and the Urban Planning Program in particular, I would like to thank you all for attending. Uh, please make sure to join us next week at the same time for our next SLIPS talk by Dr. Irid Katz, lecturer at the University of Cambridge, uh, who will be discussing the topic of cities on the move on turbulent urbanism of irregular migration.